Two people appeared in court separately today in relation to last month's unrest in KwaZulu-Natal and Gauteng. Both were charged with inciting violence through social media. Freedom of expression, of course, is a constitutional right in South Africa, but when does it cross the line? For some clarity on the matter, I'm joined by social media law specialist at the digital law company, Emma Sadler. Emma, thanks for your time. We appreciate it. So that's the question, right? There is a fine line, and when is it crossed? What justifies incitement? Yeah, it's such an interesting question, and it's lovely to speak to you this evening. And I'm so pleased that actually I've been saying for years that you can get into big trouble because of what you're putting on social media, even be arrested. And we've seen it in some criminal urea cases, but in the last few months we really have seen some incitement to public violence cases landing um, people who have tweeted inflammatory content, inciting content uh, in, uh, in uh, the courtroom on charges, on criminal charges. So it's a very interesting development that we've seen. Um, I think that we have to start with the fact that we all have the right to freedom of expression. It's a constitutional right. It's a fundamental constitutional right, actually, at the moment. I would go so far as to say it's the cornerstone of our democracy. But we all know that it's not an unlimited right. My right to freedom of expression isn't more important than conflicting rights. And the, the restriction that's actually within Section 16 of the Constitution is that the right to freedom of expression does not extend to the incitement of violence. And so what's happening is that the courts, the NPA, are saying that those tweets led to violence. We know that 337 people died in the looting and that social media really was used uh, to orchestrate the looting and to orchestrate some of those attacks which landed up in those deaths. And it's going to be a very interesting interesting case to follow. I, I, I do think that they um, are, are likely to be successful in this prosecution. But how does a court determine whether one person or two in this instance separately, their tweets actually incited the violence? Because, you know, we know that there were WhatsApps doing the rounds. We know that people were basically working on the ground trying to get South Africans to loot and burn tires on the streets, etc. So how do they prove it in this instance purely by a tweet? Do they look at the number of followers and engagements, perhaps? So the, the test is whether the reasonable consequence would be the commission of public violence. So it is an objective test. It's not uh, whether that person uh, thought that their tweet would land uh, would mean that people land up uh, committing these acts of public violence. The question is, would a reasonable person, um, if they read that tweet, go out and commit violence? Not a reasonable person. But could a reasonable person foresee that public violence could be committed? So there are a few things that the NPA are going to have to prove. You know, the two accounts that we've seen um, at the forefront of the court cases today are prolific accounts. Uh, the At African Soil account, it is a, it, it's got nearly 70,000 followers. You know, there were some specific details tweeted from those accounts about what needed to happen in the looting. And um, I think that I think it's going to be a fairly, a fairly, I don't want to say an easy thing to prove because we haven't seen that many cases along these lines. Um, but I, I suppose what I need to take you back to is that the content on social media is not treated any distinctly from content on any other public platform. So there is no difference in the way that we treat we treat a tweet to 70,000 people legally to the way we treat somebody who has a microphone in their hand standing on a stage speaking to 70,000 people in that crowd. So of course it is a little bit more difficult because you might be able to track that somebody in that crowd actually goes out and immediately commits some public violence and this you would have to show that there is a link between reading the content um, because it was published by that Twitter account and the public Public violence. Um, but I think given the scale of the, the violence, given the fact that the Hawks are really involved in this, that they've gone to the extent that they have to uncover who was behind the anonymous account, I think we are going to see a very, very interesting case unfold when it goes back to court in October and, and hopefully a prosecution, because I think that we need to understand the role that social media played in the violence that led to all of those deaths. Yeah, definitely the case. So let's talk about the language that people will use in a tweet, because many would argue it would be opinion versus incitement, because if I tweet something and think, oh, yeah, it's great that people are taking a stand against something, does that actually mean incitement? Or does it boil down to the language of the tweet? 
you know, these are all going to be criminal issues that are going to have to be canvassed in in huge detail in the courtroom. Um, but we do know that opinions are treated differently. Uh, the law in South Africa allows you to be very extreme in your opinions. Uh, we do have very robust protections around freedom of expression. But as I said earlier, that right to freedom of expression ends uh, where somebody else's right to begins. Uh, and, and, you know, what we're dealing with with public violence, especially in a case where it lands up in the death of a person, we've got the right to life on one hand and the right to freedom of expression on the other hand. And that's the balancing act that we need uh, to, to, to work out. You know, where does my right... I've spoken to you often in the past about defamation, my right to freedom of expression being balanced against your right to reputation. But as I say, in this freedom of expression section in the Constitution, there's a very specific caveat which says that this right does not extend to the right to, uh, the, to the incitement of violence. And, and, and we've seen people using very overtly their social media platforms to incite that violence. We've had a very interesting new case from the Constitutional Court a couple of weeks ago in the John Colani case, really trying to um, spell out in quite a lot of detail what constitutes hate speech, because that is a sort of a subsect um, of, of this incitement right that we're talking about. And and what they've said is that there has to be some, it has to propagate hatred. So so something can be an opinion, as we saw in that case, uh, John Colani said, call me names, but gay is not okay, and uh, made comparisons between um, homosexuality and bestiality. I mean, no question that was extreme homophobic content. And there was no question that was his opinion. It just so happens that his opinion was hate speech. So I think this idea that you can get away with anything as long as you say, oh, it's my opinion, you know, this is um, this is fake news, but it's my opinion, it's correct, it is not the defense that some people, not the magic wand that some people think it is. Yeah, definitely. And I guess we need more um, court cases like this to actually deter people on social media, because it's so hard to monitor, right? I mean, social media is huge. You have millions of people tweeting all sorts of things. But uh, hopefully one day when the courts take harsh action against these people, uh, people will think twice. Yeah, well, we've certainly seen that in some other spheres of our law. You know, I'm thinking about an employment law. We've seen how many people have been fired in South Africa or have faced serious disciplinary consequences because of what they've been putting on social media. And you just need one person within an organization to be fired because of what they've said on their WhatsApp status um, for the whole, for all the other employees to wake up and see that actually this is a big issue. And, you know, I'm actually um, aware of a number of employees who have been fired from their organizations, even if they weren't necessarily charged criminally with incitement, but because they have brought the organization into disrepute, um, you know, uh, and that's because they've been talking about their involvement in, their, in the looting or encouraging um, other people to get involved in looting or inciting violence themselves. So there is almost a lower bar where even though they haven't been criminally charged, they have actually been fired from their jobs. We've seen it in the context of criminal urea in South Africa. You know, it was it just took a Penny Sparrow and a Vicky Momberg to be charged criminally with uh, criminal urea, uh, Vicky Momberg even being sentenced to three years in prison, for people to realize that actually if you call somebody the K-word, you will be criminally charged. And that message certainly um, has to seep through the public, you know, has to, um, has to have the effect that we, we need it to have. And I often say I'm so thrilled when people of, um, when, when people have the means, uh, uh, who, people who have the means actually take action to protect themselves. I'm thinking of the criminal and Uria case, Uyanda so Mbuli laid a criminal and Uria case when she was uh, cyber bullied by somebody um, who said that she was a terrible word and then posted her cell phone number and said, please, can somebody go and find her a blesser? You might not think the most extreme case, but certainly a case of doxing and a case of cyber bullying. And she laid criminal and Uria charges in that case. It was prosecuted. And I think the effect of that means that the average teenage girl who is being cyber bullied, who may be contemplating suicide, who feels like there is no avenue, realizes that the law can come to their aid. Yeah. And so I think these cases are excellent cases just in terms of making people aware that you can't just do and say whatever you want to on social media. Yeah, great stuff. Thank you so much for your insight. Always a pleasure talking to you. Appreciate it. I was social media law specialist at the digital law company Emma Sadler. Let's